Coming up on DTNS, Facebook wants to change its name. Amazon's Just Walk Out technology arrives at a concert venue. And is it smart for Steam to ban games with NFTs? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. It's my brother's birthday. Happy birthday, Tim. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chain. We were just talking about grammar and my brother's birthday on Good Day Internet. Get that wider conversation. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Erwin Sturr, Ken Hayes, Philip Shane, your name could be right there with them. Patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, folks, PayPal supposedly might buy Pinterest. If they actually do, we'll talk about it then. Meanwhile, let's start with a few tech things you should know. A preview version of the Windows subsystem for Android is available now in the beta channel. People have been very excited about this. Beta channel Windows 11 plans to bring the preview uh, to the dev channel down the road. But if you want to try it out, you'll need to set your Windows 11 beta to the U.S. region and have a U.S.-based Amazon App Store account, because that's how it gets the Android apps. Microsoft and Amazon have curated about 50 apps to start with. Not a lot. Uh, that's just to put it to the test. So check it out now. Nikkei's sources say Oppo is developing its own chips for its flagship phones. The custom chips are targeted for release in 2023 or 2024. Oppo is the fourth, fourth largest uh, smartphone maker in the world. Wow. I'm <laughs> stunned. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, at the grocery store, they have a lot of little bits of chicken left over, so they make chicken salad. Here's sure. Facebook salad. Uh, several <laughs> Facebook stories you should know about. Uh, the UK's Competition and Markets Authority has fined Facebook approximately $69 million for consciously refusing, in their words, to report required information regarding its acquisition of Giphy. I thought maybe they were going to find him $69 million for calling it Jiffy, but that's not it. <laughs> U.S. officials announced Facebook has agreed to pay penalties of more than $14 million in a settlement with the Justice Department for failing to advertise at least 2,600 jobs to U.S. citizens and instead offering those jobs to people the company was sponsoring for green cards. Not done yet. Two more. Washington, D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine said he has named Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg as a defendant in the district's lawsuit over the improper sharing of data with Cambridge Analytica by data scientist Alexander Kogan. And one thing that isn't happening to Facebook, the social network announced it will now demote content in groups by people who have violated its policies elsewhere on the platform. No, they didn't do that before, but now they will. That's a lot of Facebook. Uh, real quick, a, 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 just a note that I'm going to read the following thing from a Brave browser. All right. Oh, very nice. The Brave browser has removed Google, Quant, and DuckDuckGo as its default search engines in various markets. New installations of the browser will use Brave's own search as its default. Brave search is built, uh, is built on an independent index and does not track users' searches or clicks. However, an ad-supported version of the service is coming soon. Yeah, I could tell. I could tell you were you were getting your facts off of an actual Brave browser. <laughs> the U.S. Department of Commerce announced it will require companies to get a license from the Bureau of Industry and Security in order to export certain security software, particularly intrusion software, to Russia and China. This extends existing rules to cover tools like Pegasus from the NSO group that don't involve encryption. Before, encryption oriented products were banned. Now, even if they don't have encryption, they still qualify for the ban. The rules do make an exemption for cyber defense purposes. They're going to try to avoid inhibiting security research and collaboration. The new extension aligns U.S. security software rules with the 42 countries that are part of Europe's Wassener Agreement. All right, let's talk about Facebook's name chains. The Verge has sources that say Facebook plans to announce a new company name next week, most likely during the annual Connect conference on October 28th, although it could happen before that. Facebook, the social network, would supposedly stay called Facebook. We're not, we're not going crazy here. The parent company, which is Facebook Inc., will get a new name in order to differentiate itself from the social network brand. Right now, there's two logos. There's the blue Facebook logo for the social network platform, and there's a gray, boring one for the Inc. Uh, well, they're just going to change the whole name. Uh, Facebook if you don't already know this, also owns Instagram, WhatsApp, Oculus, Novi Financial, Reality Labs, and a few more brands and divisions. 
Famously, back in July, Mark Zuckerberg told The Verge that the company, quote, will effectively transition from people seeing us as primarily being a social media company to being a metaverse company. Facebook has been working hard to position itself as a leader in VR and AR. Uh, they announced that plan to hire 10,000 people in Europe to work on metaverse-related projects. They promoted their head of AR and VR, Andrew Bosworth, to CTO. And The Verge notes, if you're wondering what they're going to change the name to, that Facebook recently renamed its unreleased VR game, Horizon, to be called Horizon Worlds. Now, that on its own doesn't mean much, but... They also demoed a version of their workplace software called Horizon Workrooms. So Verge is like, I don't know, maybe the new name of the company is going to be Horizon or something around the word Horizon. I'm putting my cryptocurrency on them, changing the name to the El Bob Rife company. Uh, see what you've done. Uh, you know what? I think the Horizons theory is pretty strong. Um, I want to give you, okay. Here is Scott Johnson, the average consumer of some Facebook products as they currently stand. Here's my reaction to this possible news, and that is, okay. oh, actually, great idea, Facebook. It would be good for you to change this because people look at Facebook in a very negative light these days. Uh, I do. So you're going to help me with your other products by having a different name that I can associate with it, and I think this is cool. If you would ask me about the Google Alphabet switcheroo mm -hmm. back in the day i would have said the opposite i would have said i already know google don't change the name it makes sense that it's still google alphabet's a dumb name why do we need to change it and i think the reason was is i didn't have google in the same doghouse as i have mm -hmm. facebook in right now so i have to think this is i could be wrong but i think this is the primary reason they're doing it is there's a lot of negativity uh, unavoidable negativity around a social network of any kind um, there'll always be that part of the discussion. And this is a chance for them to say, apart from that, we do all this and, and, and now we want to brand ourselves as such. Like, I think it's probably the best thing they could do. Maybe the only thing they could do at this stage. I, I think it is a practical consideration when alphabet became alphabet. The idea was very practical. It was goo. We want to separate the cost of everything. That's not actually Google from the cost of Google so that we get a real ability to report Google's results and also have separate CEOs in charge of things like Waymo uh, and Wing uh, and and have a company that isn't that we don't have to keep saying, yeah, the company's called Google, but this has nothing to do with Google. This is an entirely separate project that we're doing. And I think Facebook has a little bit of that, too. I don't think Facebook believes that everyone's going to turn around and start loving Oculus tomorrow if they change the name of the parent company to Facebook. They, they, they're not they're not crazy, but it does make it easier for them to talk about things and makes it easier for us to talk about things. If let's say they call it Horizon, uh, you say Horizon owned Oculus, which requires a Facebook login or whatever, right? Uh, it, it makes it easier for them to say, yeah, this is not a part of our company that's doing the same things as the social network. Uh, and and I, I think it's easy to overreact and be like, wow, that's not really gonna change anything. There's still Facebook under all. And yes, absolutely. But, but it will make it, it will frame things differently. And so I think that's probably why they're doing yeah. it. Yeah. I also think there's an investor angle to this that makes things a little more palatable when you start spreading yeah. it like that and have a parent company. So we'll see how it goes. Speaking of Alphabet, let's just roll right into them. Yeah. This wasn't planned at all. This is crazy. Alphabet's wing company <laughs> has expanded its drone delivery service. It's going to go into Texas. Yeah, that's right. Folks, yeah. in the, folks in the Dallas suburbs of Frisco and Little Elm can get packages delivered by wing from nearby Walgreens stores. So, I don't know, prescriptions, candy, and that's about all I get from there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, lots more things, obviously. Wing already operates drone delivery in Christenburg, Virginia. Uh, that's a less populated area, so moving out there is, is, a, is a bit of a growth. Test flights begin in Texas next week, and commercial service is expected to begin in the coming months. So if you've got some, you know, Walgreens needs, it sounds like Wing has you covered. Yeah, if if you live in Frisco and Little Elm, uh, this this is good though. This is them saying we want to try a denser urban area. Uh, we we want to expand this. We want to make this work. And and they're among dozens of companies, uh, maybe even hundreds of companies out there uh, delivering this. The the one that's been doing this the longest is Zipline. Uh, most famously in Rwanda, they they've been delivering medical uh, supplies there, you know, across mountainous terrain for for more than a decade now. But we really haven't seen this 
in urban areas. So this is an important milestone to, to see one of these companies say, let's let's try it in the suburbs, in a, in a big metro area like Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, if you're not if you're not familiar, it's you know it's among the top ten metro areas in the United States, so it's a it's a populated area. Uh, but of course, they're they're going to limit that test. They're not going to do the entire DFW area uh, to start with. They're going to they're going to start small. But uh, that's that's how it happens. Now the question is, will they run into too many problems? Uh, they're going to do this test and and ask the community for feedback around it. Maybe they never do get to launch the commercial service if they have too many problems, or or maybe it all goes well and. People in Frisco are ordering their M&Ms uh, from Walgreens to be delivered by drone. I, I do. I do look forward to the the day when these services start to grow to the point that you know they have successful tests in these test markets and they can start to support other stores. Because what I would like to do, and I'm not kidding about this, I really want to do this. My first drone delivery, I want to be a drone. So I want to buy like a <laughs> drone, you know. But I, I want a drone to bring drone. the. That's I want amazing. the drone to bring the drone, which will be yeah. in a box. Yeah, yeah. I, I just need to do that before I die. That's a, that's they a bucket They sell lister. little mini drones at Walgreens. Yeah. So if they've if got, got them at Walgreens and if I lived in Texas or the these Virginia locations, I'd yeah. be all set. Yeah. I'm all yeah, in. I was really disappointed. My my nephew lives in Canberra, uh, Australia, and they're doing burrito deliveries in Canberra from a burrito restaurant, but not in his neighborhood. Oh, so man. Think of the data you could get if you just had one family member getting burritos by the air. That'd be amazing. Mm. Perfect for so DTNS. <laughs> burritos by air. The future is now. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on. We've got a trifecta of big tech announcements concluding Wednesday. I don't know if you guys noticed there was a lot this week with a Samsung Galaxy Unpacked event. And it wasn't all software, as some people named Tom. I won't say last names. Maybe expected. Yeah, I totally uh, Here's what we got. <laughs> First of all. We got the Maison Kitsune. Uh, this is a brand, fashion brand, a lot of you are probably familiar with. Uh, they have a very cute box face for a logo. You can now get a Galaxy Watch 4 and Galaxy Buds 2 with the Fox on those. Oh, that is going to matter to a whole bunch of people that aren't me. Uh, but I'm excited for you. Okay, I really am. Second, there was a Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 Bespoke Edition. Hopefully it won't be an addiction. Uh, <laughs> that lets you customize the color of the back and front of the phone with supposedly 49 different color combinations that will be available, at least at the beginning. The frame is limited to black or silver, though. Uh, it costs $100 more than the regular Flip 3 to get those custom colors, so be prepared for that. And if you change your mind later, you can swap to a new color with something called Bespoke Upgrade Care Service, starting at $79, and that will happen in November. Uh, finally, the Galaxy Watch 4 they also... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, they should have named it the Bespoke Artisan Upgrade Care Service. <laughs> That's Go better. Ahead. That's better. Upgrade Care Service sounds like my car is getting new tires, but whatever. Uh, finally, the Galaxy Watch 4 also got bespoke options, but the bigger news here is an update to Wear OS. It now offers fall detection, so this is good news for me lately, and a knock-knock gesture to launch a pre-selected app. Yeah, they got some new watch faces and, and live uh, wallpaper and, and stuff like that. But honestly, the the one that's going to affect the most people is probably the Wear OS update uh, because uh, there's there's a good number of Watch 4 users out there. And, and this is bringing Wear, us, Wear OS up to par with the Galaxy Watch 3, which was based on Samsung's Tizen operating system. And Galaxy Watch 4 is based on Wear OS. So the things like fall detection were available to the Galaxy Watch 3, but not to the Watch 4. So filling in some gaps there. Although on the most part, Wear OS is is more functional than than the old version based on Tizen. Uh, the the bespoke edition thing is is interesting. I don't know that that gooses a lot of sales of the Flip 3, but I, I think it's an interesting way of doing things. And maybe they do it on the Flip 3 to limit how often they have to do it, and it's a bit of a test. But the but the idea that that you can not just pick from four colors, but pick from 49 different color combinations, uh, I think for some people is pretty exciting, right? Because they, oh, they, yeah. they consider their phone to be as much a fashion advice as it is a practical thing. I completely agree. Like there, there's certainly, uh, well, there's no, there's no limit to various brands trying to lean into customization and or color combinations or whatever. It's long been, you know, uh, I think an important part of phone ownership is to be able to choose from more than just two or one. Um, and every time colors come out for a for a product I, on like a Monday's Apple announcement, they uh, those mini, um, what are they called? I forgot already. The the mini music balls, whatever they're called, I can't think of the name. 
anyway, <laughs> uh, those things coming out in additional colors, I usually kind of smirk and go, oh, well, that's, that's a real innovation, guys. You got a different uh, Pantone color to choose from. Neat. But at the end of the day. HomePod. HomePod. Jeez. How well, could I not either one of us think of that? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, music balls, you know how that's the better term, which they should have gone with that. But point being, uh, that kind of choice is clearly stuff customers like. I like to be able to choose from a number of colors, and I like to know that you know they. I like to know that there are more options than that. Hundred bucks for a you know an extra color on the back or front. I don't know how I feel about that, but there are going to be some people who are over the moon. So good for them. Yeah. Ah, uh, good stuff. All right. So big announcement week finally concluded. Uh, folks, we have another companion series here. If you're a patron, you get these episodes. Uh, but if you're not, go check out Know a Little More at knowalittlemore.com. I dig deep into big tech topics. Sometimes I'll bring on an expert like I did with Stacey Higginbotham to talk about the matter system for smart homes. Uh, sometimes I just dive in deep and explain something like I did last week with RCS. This week's episode is the perfect companion for Mollywood's How We Survive how We Survive is all about batteries, and this week on Know a Little More, I'll be digging deep into lithium-ion batteries. Why they're the battery of choice, how they work, kind of a little bit about how batteries work in general. So check that out uh, before it comes out, knowalittlemore.com. You may not like or even understand NFTs, but lots of people do, and it's become a thing. Uh, quick catch-up, NFT stands for Non-Fungible Token. It's a cryptographic way to make a record that is very hard to change. Not a not an album. I mean, like a you know a record of something. Like Scott owes me money, or Scott owns my uh, picture of a fox. Non fungible means that it's unique. So Bitcoin tokens are not unique. Each Bitcoin is pretty much identical to another, just like a dollar bill is is exactly identical to another dollar bill. NFTs say, ah, this thing that we recorded is different than any other. It's unique. Uh, it's most frequently used to show ownership of a digital item, but keep in mind, it's not copy protection, just a recording of who owns something or, or a fact. For more on how that actually works, if you're like, how can you keep that from just being copied or faked, check out our episode of Know a Little More on blockchain that we put out earlier. So if you have a digital item that we can say belongs to you, is that worth anything beyond bragging rights? Well, for some, that's enough. There's a lot of people doing that, but... Another nascent use is a game. If I own the sword with plus 50 damage, a game could use NFTs to respect that and only allow me to wield it in the game. They check the NFTs. Ah, that's Tom. He gets to use that sword. It allows me to sell that sword or give it away to someone else and still have only one version of it in the game. For instance, the Loot Project is one example of a project that's doing that. Last Friday, the news broke that Valve had added a rule to its list of what you shouldn't publish on Steam that prohibits, and I quote, applications built on blockchain technology that issue or allow exchange of cryptocurrencies or NFTs, specifically NFTs. Now, Space Pirate Games, uh, the developer of the game Age of Rust, pointed it out on Twitter, saying they had been in good communication with Steam about this. And they understand why Steam is doing it. Steam says they don't want games on the platform where the in-game item has real-world value. That has caused problems on others. Now, granted, there are things that have a real-world value because people assign them to them, but NFTs particularly intentionally have a, a value. It's different than a CSGO item. Epic Games, on the other hand, told Verge that it's, quote, open to games that support cryptocurrency or blockchain-based assets on its game store. A uh, seemingly logical thing to do for Epic, a competitor of Valve, to say. Epic said games would have to comply with financial laws, be clear how the blockchain is used in the game, and have proper age ratings, but they're thinking about it. Epic would not let developers use its payment system to accept crypto. and have to be another way of you getting the NFTs. Epic's self-publishing system right now is in closed beta, so we don't know what the real world impact of this is yet and keep in mind that back on september 27th epic ceo tim sweeney said on twitter quote we aren't touching nfts as the whole field is currently tangled up with an intractable mix of scams interesting decentralized tech foundations and scams <laughs> he said scams twice on purpose mm -hmm. uh 
So I guess this means that NFTs won't be banned from Epic because they'd like all those games that are getting kicked off of Steam to come over to Epic, but Epic itself won't put NFTs in its games. Anyway, the upshot is blockchain, NFT, and gaming, they're all hot buzzwords that combined will give you plus five funding when rolling venture capital. So the question is, who wants this and who will try it? Are there better ways to do scarcity in games? There are other ways. Will this just end up crashing and burning with a series of games that let the person with the most money win because they can buy all the cool NFTs? Casey Newton at The Verge points out in a column today that this idea of unique items being traded in a virtual world like a game sits squarely in a well-funded buzzword called the metaverse. I mentioned that regarding Facebook earlier. Uh, being able to own a thing in the metaverse, a virtual world, is kind of fundamental to that. So, Scott, is Valve making a horrible mistake by kicking NFTs off of Steam, or is this the Diablo auction house all over again? Well, I'm so glad you brought up that Diablo auction house. It was uh, it was an example of not NFTs, obviously. We weren't there yet, but in 2012, when that game launched, the real money auction house allowed you to go into <clears throat> basically a, an auction house storefront and purchase items from other players. And the way it would, it was non-fungible, quote unquote, because it wasn't. But the way it was, was they were tied to your account through your Blizzard account. And when you sold those items, the transfer of that item would go to whoever bought it from you, and now they own it. Blizzard would take a cut, and you would get a cut, and that was the transaction. Um, it was horribly received by players who felt like the system diminished the gameplay experience and the earning of items in-game, and instead put a focus on this weird outside seller's market, which is why they dropped it in pretty quick time. Um, so all of that being said, do I think they're making a mistake? No, because I don't think the time is right yet. I think there will come a time where this is the norm. And by norm, I don't mean that somebody somewhere is making way too much money on a sword they sold. What I mean is I can picture a time, metaverse, games, wherever, where a developer has a game and there are swords in it. We'll stay with the sword analogy because it's a good one. Um, loot of, of value in a video game. And the game makers themselves say, well, this sword of destiny, to, <laughs> to, to borrow a term from another thing, uh, is, is really cool. And it's the only one that exists and only you can have it. And there's a 0.5% chance it'll ever drop for you in the world. And that's it. There isn't a store to buy it. There isn't a place to get it. It's just there. And what happens is the thing dropped for you. You got lucky on a Saturday afternoon and the only one ever dropped and it was you who got it. Now you own it. There is an NFT that says you own it. No money had to transact, but the record is there. That's the kind of future I want to see with NFT and games, not just another money revenue channel, but like how interesting it is that you in this vast world you're playing in are the only one with the sword of destiny. That's a huge concept and very cool, but it's when it gets tied up when who gets what money and how are you going to pay for it? And do you have crypto? Can we do dollars to crypto conversion on your store? Like all of that stuff may or may not come, but I don't think that's what gamers care about at all. I think what they yeah. care about is scarcity in a more pure game sense that you're going to get an item and it's yours. I think it's just too early and steam can very easily wait yes until NFTs have worked out the scam, comma, other thing, comma, scam problem that Tim Sweeney so accurately pointed out. Uh, because I do I do believe that NFTs will shake all of that stuff out and we will find a useful thing for them. Now, maybe it won't end up being that useful for games. Maybe we'll find out that there's problems with it or there's a way better way to manage scarcity across platforms. Uh, I think it, there is an advantage to having a platform for scarcity that you don't have to build every time. Any object-oriented programmer knows this. Like It's way better to take a, a really useful piece of code and just use it than have to go from scratch every time. So if NFTs prove themselves to be good at this, then yeah, why not take it? But maybe somebody will come up with a better way of doing this because they're inspired by it. I don't know. However, if NFTs shake off all the scams, if it proves to be a pretty reliable and good way to do item scarcity, then I think Steam changes their mind down the road. There's no yeah, reason they I can't. Agree. And say I like, agree. oh, now that NFTs are, are, are not you know scam ridden anymore, and now we know how to shake out the scams, uh, we'll allow them into the stores again. Yeah, because honestly, the whole foundation of Steam used to be a scam, a, a place that claimed to be a place you hold all your video games and buy and send us money and we'll take a chunk of it and then you'll just only have it digitally and not physically. These were all scam ridden at one point, these ideas. 
Yeah. So their very founding is based on a previously sketchy thing. Apple and their music. Every you could look at a million examples. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a case where I do think it's just not time yet. And when the time's right, of course they'll do it. I think Epic's being a little cheeky here, if, if I'm honest. They're not really doing anything. They're just saying we're open, unlike our competitor, but that doesn't mean anything. We're not going to see anything right away. So, yeah, give it some time. They'll all be doing it. Email itself is scam ridden. Yeah, but we yeah, still it use it. We figured it out. We figured out how to how to use it. All right. Yep. Snob OS's Nika Monfort is back to spotlight a black tech entrepreneur who made her name developing fintech to help the unbanked and underbanked. Hi, this is Nika Monfort of the Snob OS Show with another episode of Teching While Black. In this segment, I bring awareness to an innovative black leader in technology. This week's spotlight is on Sheena Allen. CEO and founder of Sheena Allen Apps and Capway. Hailing from Terry, Mississippi, she is a serial entrepreneur and fintech leader and graduate of the University of Southern Mississippi. In 2011, she created her first company, Sheena Allen Apps, that included a suite of five separate apps, which she bootstrapped to ultimately garner millions of downloads. In 2016, she had an idea that would organize money and spending. This idea eventually became Capway, which is a FDIC-approved financial service provider with the core service of mobile banking. Capway's goal is to fill financial gaps and create financial access and opportunities for those who have been underserved and overlooked by the traditional financial system, including individuals who are unbanked and underbanked. Her work with Capway has earned her the title holder as the youngest female in America to own and operate a digital bank. Additionally, Sheena has been featured in various publications, including Inc. Magazine, Essence, and Black Enterprise. Now, she's has been on essentially every influential 30 under 30 list, including Business Insider, Forbes, and Inc. Magazine. Also, she was on the Inc. Magazine Female Founders 100 list. Needless to say, she is definitely one to watch. To find out more about Sheena Allen and her work, you can follow her on Twitter at WhoIsSheena and at SheenaAllen.com and Capway.com. Join me next time as I highlight another Black tech innovator. When we are aware of all innovative voices, especially those in underrepresented groups, the tech community thrives. Thank you, Nika. I mean, that that is one impressive person. Uh, and uh, we've got links if you want to find out more about Sheena Allen in the show notes, SheenaAllen.com, who, Twitter.com slash who is Sheena. Thank you, Nika. Los Angeles' fabulous forum is an older arena that was remodeled in the mid-teens, the 20-teens, not the 19-teens, uh, and purchased in March 2020 by Los Angeles Clippers owner Steve Ballmer. Yeah, that Ballmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, owns a team with a nickname dangerously close to Clippy. And the forum was the site this week of not only an Eagles concert... <laughs> for real, uh, but also a stadium concession stand using Amazon's Just Walk Out technology. Unlike most concession stands, you don't have to stand awkwardly in the walkway waiting behind 12 other people to get a hot dog. With this one, you use a credit card to get into the concession area, then just grab whatever you want, walk out, and you're done. Uh, the forum will not be installing more of these. There's just the one down by the stage because it's costly to retrofit, but it's meant as a test run for their installation in the new Intuit Dome, being built from scratch to open in 2024 and become the new home of the Clippers. Yeah, 100% behind uh, this idea of bringing it outside of the Amazon closed-in sort of ecosphere of, you know, their stores and stores they own into broader places. I think a place like this is a great idea, any kind of sports arenas. I think Comic-Cons, um, imagine this sort of thing happening anywhere where you need to just go in, browse for a thing, and get out of there without huge lines and, you know, nightmare checkout scenarios. So I, pff, this, I've never been more for an emerging tech than this. I love this. And I, I know I, among other people, have been wondering like, okay, Amazon's cool, nifty walkout tech. That's great. Amazon makes it work. Is anybody else going to adopt this? Can it, can it work without Amazon, you know, juking the system to make it work for them? Apparently, yes. Here's, here's an example at yeah. the fabulous forum. 
I just think it's still, to this day, we'll say it's still dangerous for them to call that just walk out given uh, some of the issues they've had in their warehouses. So I'm just saying, Amazon, your naming convention here is maybe just a little on the nose. You might want to rethink it. Just saying. <laughs> Hey, real quickly, thanks to VJ who sent us some recommendations uh, for third-party MagSafe-like cables that you could use on a Windows PC. I did forward those on to Aussie Nick. Uh, thank you, VJ, for that. Keep those emails coming. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Thanks to our brand new bosses, Christopher Masterson and Jason, who just started back at us on Patreon. I told you, if you become a patron, you get made a big deal about. So huge thanks to Christopher and Jason. Y'all rock. Uh, we we are down a few patrons still on the day, but uh, on the month. But uh, Christopher and Jason helping us get back to balance. And uh, if you've been thinking about joining and getting the wonderful benefits, now's the time. patreoncom slash DTNS. Thank you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Before we go, what do you got going on to tell the fine folks about? Well, uh, f uh, many of you who who did this will know you've already gotten them at least hopefully you've gotten them at least you have tracking numbers but we finally shipped the last of the kickstarter fulfillment for my rock runners card game that i designed and did all the art for and while i'm thrilled to tell people that i'm also thrilled to tell those who missed the kickstarter or otherwise were on you know the fence for a while or think you might want to check it out now we have some up in the store uh so you just have to go check it out frogpants.com slash store it's the first two listings there and uh, grab it, see what you think. Everybody's been giving great feedback, and I'm loving hearing it, so I'd love to hear more. Uh, that's, again, frogpants.com slash store. And for everything else, frogpants.com will get you there, as well as my uh, Twitter account. You can find me at Scott Johnson. Our best to our good friend and co-host, Sarah Lane. Get well soon. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>